So thank you very much. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. I uh, have learned since I've arrived that inequality is a big topic in New Zealand, uh, especially right at the moment. A report came out that said that inequality here has grown more than in some other countries, though not as much as in the United States where I'm based these days. So um, hopefully what I'm going to say about how inequality starts really early in life and maybe some of the things that, that can be done about it will be um, resonant for you all. And another I actually interesting thing about giving this talk in, in New Zealand is that uh, Sir Peter Gluckman is one of the real um, you know, earliest people to be working in this area. Uh, and so in large part what I'm doing is building off of some of the, the work that he has done. So a, a starting point for much of what I'm going to be talking about today is the idea that pregnancy and early childhood are what you might call critical periods for child development. We think that both nature and nurture are important and especially that they interact and I'm going to try and show a few examples um, that suggest that those interactions are really important. Um, one way or one theory to think about how this works is that the environment actually affects the way that your genes are expressed. So you have your genetic code which only changes slowly over time, but you could think of that as having maybe on-off switches uh, associated with it and the environment determines which of those things get turned on and off. And we think that, that uh, those settings, if you like, can actually be then transmitted to the next generation. So things that look like they're part of the genetic code are actually uh, shaped by the environment and the epigenetic setting of these switches. So there are many studies that now s link health at birth to future outcomes that we care about or we as an economist care about, things like people's education, their earnings, whether they're employed or not, whether they're disabled or not in later life. A lot of this research uh, that I'm going to be talking to you about focuses on birth weight as an indicator of health at birth. Um, this is sort of a crude indicator, right? If you think about your own children, obviously there's uh, other things besides their birth weight that were probably important about their health at birth. Um, but a good thing about it is that it's pretty well measured. It's measured for every baby and it's been measured for a long period of time in many different societies. So this is a little bit a case of looking for your keys under the light post because the light is coming from the light post. Right? So we, we look where we have the light to see. Uh, I'm just going to show you one example of uh, correlation between birth weight and future outcomes. This data is from a nationally representative study mm -hmm. in the US that started with some people between the ages of 14 and 21 in 1978 and then followed them forward. When those people had their own children, they started surveying the, the children. So we know for those people a lot about their socioeconomic status and their birth weight and then those children have been followed up until they were young adults. So you can look then at the relationship between their birth weight and their earnings when they're young adults. And if you do that, um, it looks like this. So here the size of the dot corresponds to how many data points you have. And so you can see that uh, at the end, there's not that many people who survive who were two and a half pounds or three pounds. So most of the mass is between six pounds and eight pounds. Um, but you can also see that there's a clear upward slope there. So if I have a large group of people and all I know about them is their birth weight, I could predict something about who is going to be a higher earner just from that one piece of information. Now, of course, you'd want to do better than that, just say that there's this correlation. So one way that you can try and get at something that's a, a little bit more causal or 
uh, at least try and control for differences in people's background is to compare um, people to their own siblings or in some cases to their own twins. Okay? So what that does is obviously people who are siblings you know, have the same parents. They're twins, they have the same parents. They also have the same um, circumstances and so that naturally controls for a, a lot of things that might be difficult to pick up in a, a survey or to measure in another way. Um, I don't want to argue that it's a perfect control because obviously parents can treat even twins differently from each other and so there's still individual factors that matter but this is one way to control for a lot of common factors to um, both children. This kind of research design has been used increasingly uh, in, in a lot of different settings to show that differences in birth weight are associated with differences in education. And that's been shown in studies in Scandinavian countries, but also Chile, US, Great Britain, and Canada. You can also show that birth weight is related <coughs> to people's future earnings. Those kinds of studies have mostly been conducted in Scandinavia, uh, mostly because it's easier to get data in Scandinavia than in a lot of other places. And you can show that birth weight is related to people's future health. And all of these things, of course, are important to their future well-being. So just to show you one example of such a study, this is one of the earlier studies to do this with a, a large group. Um, this study by Sandra Black, Paul Devereaux, and Shel Savannis looked at all Norwegian births from 1967 to 1997. And within that set, they focused on, on siblings and in some cases twins. And they were able to match the birth data that they had to data from other administrative databases like tax records so that they would have people's earnings, education records, so they have people's educational attainment. For men, all the men had to uh, do compulsory <coughs> military service, so they all had IQ tests and measures of their height from when they went into military service. Okay, so using that kind of data, then we can relate differences within a family in birth weight to differences in these kinds of outcomes. So if you plot that out, which is what this figure is doing, you see a relationship that looks something like this. Now, you, you see there's lots of bouncing around at the each end <coughs> of this graph and that's again because there's not very many people who survived at this time who were less than 1500 grams at birth or greater than about 3700 grams at birth but if you focus on the middle part you see that it's uh, pretty upward sloping and the three different lines here correspond to the the open circles are the non-twins the gray squares are the twin comparisons, and then the black triangles are uh, comparing the twins. Okay, so uh, the black triangles here are the preferred estimates where we're just looking at the within twin comparison. Um, they don't look that different than the gray squares, um, and all three of those lines are upward sloping. So what these are showing is that if you compared twins, a twin who was 3,500 grams, or about 7.5 pounds, is about 10% more likely to finish high school than a twin who is 1,900 grams, or around 4 pounds. Okay, so that's a fairly large effect. And if we look at a bunch of different outcomes, this figure is in the first two bars sort of reproducing what I just showed you for the probability of finishing high school. Then we have uh, IQ scores, which is only for males, um, earnings and also height. And here I'm comparing um, uh, an ordinary least squares regression which just controls for a few things and the twin fixed effects estimates. That's the light blue and the dark blue bars. You can see it doesn't make that much difference <coughs> to the estimate. And so broadly what we're saying is say for IQ, 10% uh, difference in birth weight would be associated with about a 1% difference in IQ. Okay? So this is all just to show that <coughs> differences that are observable at birth are associated with long-term outcomes for things that we really care about. Okay, I've also used US data to try and show a similar thing. 
It's a little bit harder in the US because it's much harder to get access to suitable data. Um, what I've done is to look at birth certificates and in the US the birth certificate has the mother's name of course and then it also says where the mother was born. So if I start with a baby, say in 1989, I can find that baby's mother and then if the mother was born in California, I can find her mother, so I think about her as the grandmother. So I have a grandmother, a mother and a baby. And then I can look for mothers who were sisters, that is they have the same grandmother, right, on the record. Okay. And if I compare mothers who are sisters, where one sister was low birth weight and the other one wasn't, then I can look ahead and say, okay, when <coughs> those two women had their own children, what was their status at that time? And what I can see is that the sister who was low birth weight in that comparison has less education at the time that she gives birth to her own baby and is also more likely to be living in a high poverty postal code. Okay. At this point I'm getting repetitive, right? I'm saying well low birth weight is related to these future outcomes. But the interesting new twist that I want to introduce here is that that effect of being low birth weight depends on whether the sister was born in a low income place herself. Okay. So these grandmothers, some of them improved their situation in life. They start off in a low income place, they move to a high income place. I observe one child who was born in the low income place, one child who was born in the high income place. The one who was born in the high income place presumably has a better childhood in some respects. And what I see is that the impact of low birth weight is less for, for that person. So graphically here, um, what I'm trying to show in the first set of bars, it says overall, this is the effect of low birth weight on mother's um, education in orange and the probability that she lives in a high income postal code in blue. So both of those things are reduced by being low birth weight overall. Mm -hmm. But then if I separate the moms into ones who are born in a low income postal code and ones who are born in a high income postal code, almost all of that effect of low birth weight is accounted for by people who are also poor. Okay? So that's kind of the good news in the sense that what this suggests is that even if I have this, this biological insult that I was born low birth weight, if I lived in a high income place, that doesn't have very much of a negative effect on me. Okay? So that must mean that my family was able to do something to compensate for that biological insult. Okay? So this is kind of a proof of concept that there are things we can do for these kids that would overcome that uh, negative effect. Okay. Now another thing I, I mentioned was that this poor health at birth, uh, which can be induced by the environment, can be also transmitted from one generation to the next. So we tend to assume that if we see something that's transmitted from one generation to the next, that that must be kind of strictly uh, genetic and that there's nothing we can do to interfere with that. Okay. But in experiments with animals, they've shown that if you, uh, for example, have a bunch of pregnant rats and you starve them, then the baby rats will be born low birth weight and then when those rats grow up and have their own pups, that those pups will be lower birth weight. Okay? So that effect on the, the grandmother rat, if you like, um, can be transmitted to the grandbaby rats. And so that's an environmental effect that's transmitted across generations. So in the California data, I tried to sort of uh, mimic that design by looking at mothers who were sisters and looking at the effect of the mother's low birth weight on the infant's low birth weight. And there again, what you can see is that effect is mediated by whether the mom was in a low poverty uh, postal code compared to if she was in a high poverty postal code. So she's more likely to transmit that trait of low birth weight to her own baby if she's also poor. So just to summarize so far, I've been making this argument that health at birth is an important aspect of child development 
in part because it predicts future outcomes like earnings, employment, and education, also because it can be transmitted to the next generation. So, you know, given this evidence about how important this is, it should be really disturbing if you see large inequalities in health at birth. And of course, that's exactly what you do see. Um, if you look at the U.S. data, so this is data from, from 14 states, everybody in those states who was born in 2011. Uh, I'm focusing on people, mothers, who are between the ages of 19 and 39, so I'm, I'm leaving out the teen moms, I'm leaving out the older moms. I'm looking at only single births because we know that um, multiple births are more likely to be low birth weight. And you can see within this sort of relatively homogeneous group, if I uh, do various contrasts, you can see there's a lot of inequality. So if I compare African American moms versus non-African American moms, the African American moms are almost twice as likely to have low birth weight babies, more than 10%. If I look only at the non-African American moms and look by education, High school, uh, or high school dropout moms are more likely to have low birth weight babies. Similarly, if I look at single moms versus married moms, big discrepancy. And then in the last bars there, what I'm trying to uh, get at is something like a more cumulative measure of disadvantage. So there I'm comparing African American moms who are high school dropouts with white college educated moms. And I picked those groups uh, because they're the ones that have the, the most extreme differences in the outcomes. And so what you can see is that about 13% of the African American high school dropout moms are having low birth weight babies and uh, you know, less than 4% of the white college educated moms are having low birth weight babies. So those are babies who are starting off with really different uh, endowments in life. Okay, so that's obviously very sobering. Uh, on the other hand, things have been slowly getting better over time. So again, going back to the, the kind of genetic argument, when I present a table like the one I just showed you, people often come up to me and say, well, you know, maybe those groups are just different. Maybe it's normal for African Americans to have small babies, for example. <coughs> but if that was the case, you wouldn't expect this to be changing uh, in real time. And you can see here that the, the rate of low birth weight has been falling, <coughs> although it's still disturbingly high. Okay. And if you look at uh, prematurity, since most low birth weight babies are, are premature, you see a similar type of um, pattern. Okay. Now, if you look at slightly older children, um, you also see a lot of inequality by socioeconomic status. Um, but I'm going to try and walk you through this kind of complicated plot because I think this plot is also showing um, some, some really good news, at least about what's been going on in the US. Okay, so what does this show? Along the bottom axis, I've lined up counties by poverty rates. So the ones near zero are ones that have very little poverty, and the ones near 100 are ones that are very poor. Okay, so the fact that the lines uh, and then on the, the y-axis, I have the mortality rate. Okay, so the fact that the lines are all upward sloping is saying that places that are poor have higher child mortality rates. Right? So that's not very surprising. Now, the three different lines here are for different time periods. The blue triangles are for 1990, and the green circles and the red squares are both for 2010. Now, why do I have green circles and red squares? Um, because in the U.S. they started giving people the option of selecting more than one race. And a lot of younger people do that. So a lot of people will not just check that they're white or black or Hispanic, they'll check that I'm white, black, and Hispanic. Okay? So depending on how I um, treat that, the red squares here are including the people who put multiple race, and the green circles are having only the people who put only uh, whatever the race is in the, the graph. Okay, so that's kind of interesting, but not my main point here. Uh, the main point is that if you go from 1990 to 2010, all of those lines have fallen. Okay, so more child mortality has fallen both in rich places and in poor places. 
And generally, it's fallen more in the poorest places than in the richest places. Okay, so lately in the US, there's been a lot of controversy about inequality and mortality. A lot of people saying inequality and mortality is increasing. It turns out all of those studies are looking at people over 45. And among people over 45, inequality and mortality is increasing. But if you look at children, inequality and mortality has been falling dramatically. Okay? And we know that inequality in income has been growing over this period. Child poverty has been growing over this period. Okay? So there's rather a puzzle here, um, which is, you know, we know that child health is related to socioeconomic status. I showed you that the mortality rates are always higher in the poorest places. We know that inequality has been going up over time. And yet, these inequalities in child health have been decreasing. So why, why is that? And that's what I'm going to spend the rest of my, my time talking about. There's a bunch of possibilities. One possibility is that there could be just changes in who's having children. Another one is that there could be improvements in medical care. And in the US, I'm going to argue that this has been really important. There have been big expansions of public health insurance for poor women and children. And I think this has had a major impact. There's also um, a long-term improvement in maternal health. So in, in the 60s, particularly for African Americans, there was a big improvement in health. People got access to hospitals for the first time. Um, and so that has an intergenerational effect and ha means that the children become healthier. Uh, another possibility is reductions in pollution. And I'll, I'll show you that those have been significant as well. And then finally, we'll consider whether there might be some changes in, in maternal behaviors that could be driving some of this. Okay, so fertility, I'm going <coughs> to mostly argue that it's not fertility. Um, there's a possibility that if the most disadvantaged women stopped having kids, then, you know, for that group, uh, the ones who are still in there, the, the average health might rise. Uh, but I don't think that's what's happening. The share of births in the most disadvantaged groups is um, fairly constant over time, and the share of births to women in the more advantaged groups is increasing. So medical care. Um, the U.S. really expanded public health insurance for pregnant women and for young children starting in the late 1980s. Um, so I think people outside the U.S. often have this view that almost all the health care in the U.S. is private, which is false because there's public health insurance for poor women and children and there's public health insurance for old people and that accounts for more than 50% of all the spending. So it's really much more of a mix of public-private. Um, for the babies, about 40% of babies now are paid for by public health insurance. Okay, so this is really a major part of the market. And some work back in the 90s that I did showed that these expansions of health insurance had an immediate effect on people's health. And now there's kind of a second wave of research showing, now that those kids are growing up, that it's actually having a long-term effect on their health as well. Some of those studies have looked at things like how much taxes people are paying as a measure of how productive they are, looked at uh, mortality rates, and I'm going to show you one picture from one study that looked at hospitalization rates, but I'll show you that in a minute. This <coughs> is just showing how those uh, expansions of public health insurance were phased in. Um, in the US, eligibility for public health insurance is is tied to um, the federal poverty line and uh, everything is expressed in terms of what fraction of the federal poverty line you are at. So if the federal poverty line was $14,000 and the cutoff is 50% of the federal poverty line, then the cutoff would be like $7,000. Okay, so this is for Texas, which is a very stingy state. And um, you can see that in 1986, people with incomes less than 50% of the poverty line were eligible for public health insurance. So a lot of poor people were not eligible. Okay. Then the blue line here is showing the eligibility expansion for zero to three year olds. The red line is four to eight year olds. And so the general point is that by around 2000, 
people were covered up to 200% of poverty, right? So it went from 50% to 200%. That's a really big increase. All the states were doing this at their own <coughs> pace. And so nationally, you had uh, a very large increase in the number of children eligible for public health insurance. So here, the y-axis is the fraction of children eligible. It goes up from 20% of kids up to over 50% of kids over this period. Okay. So now this paper is showing the impact of that on the affected children in terms of whether they were hospitalized for some sort of chronic condition. And interestingly enough, in the age group that we're talking about, most of these hospitalizations are actually mental health. Like a lot of people are getting hospitalized um, for those kind of conditions. And so here, uh, a, a quirk of this legislation was that you were only eligible if you were born after September 1, 1983. So if you were born on August 31st, 1983, you were just permanently out of luck in terms of these eligibility expansions. Okay? So here in this picture, the people who are on your left are the people who were never eligible. And you can see there is a decline in hospitalization rates over time. <coughs> But then time zero here is September 1, 1983, and everybody to the right are the people who are eligible. Okay? So what I'm trying to show is this discrete drop in the probability of hospitalization among people in their mid-20s who were eligible for public health insurance from the time that they were born. Okay? So I think that's pretty dramatic. Now, you might think, okay, that's ancient history, what happened in the, the 90s. Um, is there anything else that can be done now that we've given people public health insurance? And so I just want to run through one example to argue that, well, there's actually a lot of low-hanging fruit here. There's a lot of things that you could do to improve people's health which are not being done. One example is vaccination for influenza. Okay, now, vaccination rates for pregnant women with influenza tend to be pretty low. In the U.S., they were almost non-existent before the H1N1 epidemic in 2009, which really hit pregnant women hard. Uh, and that encouraged more people to go out and get vaccinated. So now vaccination rates in the states are about 50% for pregnant women. Okay? So there's still 50% who are not vaccinated. Why does influenza matter? Well, because it causes preterm labor, which is linked to low birth weight. So, um, I'm going to show you some data for three northeastern states, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York City. Um, this is birth records where we have the mother's name, so we can link births to the same mother. And then I'm also going to link that to the Center for Disease Control Influenza Surveillance Reports, which talk about the fraction of patients who have influenza. So that's how they track flu outbreaks. Okay, so if you plot these two things side by side, what you see um, in the left-hand side plot is gestation length, and there's this big dip for babies who were conceived in May. Okay. Now, babies who are conceived in May come to term in January and February, which in the U.S. is the height of the flu season. Okay. So if you compare that to the right-hand side graph, you see there's a big peak in uh, influenza patients uh, for those babies who are conceived in May. Okay, so those two things line up very nicely. The three different lines here, the, the green line is the one that's comparing siblings born to the same mother. So this is like for the same mom, on average, if she has a baby conceived in May, that baby will have shorter gestation than her other babies. Now, of course, this is a correlation. This doesn't really prove anything. Um, but one way you can get a little more insight into this is to go back and look at that H1N1 epidemic because it had a different timing than most other uh, flu epidemics. It was earlier. Okay? So if I plot that one um, kind of separately, here the red line is the H1N1 epidemic, and the blue line is all the other normal flu years. Okay, so in the normal flu year, the people who are conceived in May have the shortest gestation. Um, and if you 
look at the people who were conceived in, uh, so for 2009, it was the people who were conceived in March, okay, because that's because the whole flu cycle was shifted two months earlier. Okay. So I think this, this provides some reasonably convincing evidence that uh, flu is linked to short gestation, and so this really simple measure, just vaccinating people for flu, could prevent preterm birth and low birth weight in many babies. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, improvements in mother's early life health could also lead to improvements in infant health. Um, the basic argument is healthier kids become healthier adults, healthier adults have healthier babies. So that's a pretty simple argument. Um, what we've uh, looked at to try and, and show this is these racial inequalities in early life health, which were very pronounced um, in previous decades in the US. So uh, just for an example, this figure is showing data for Georgia, one of the southern states. And this is infant mortality rates starting in 1960 and going to 1990. Here the green line is black infant mortality rates. The red line is white infant mortality rates. Okay, so you can see for whites, infant mortality was going down really slowly over this period. But for blacks, infant mortality was really high, 20%. And it starts going down right in the mid-60s. Okay, so what was that all about? That was the Civil Rights Act which um, basically gave people access to hospitals. So babies started being born in hospitals, babies started being taken to hospital when they had things like diarrhea, and then they didn't die. So we use this improvement in mother's health to show that the cohorts who are affected uh, go on to have healthier babies. Um, and we do that using the um, vital statistics data and using post-neonatal mortality rates, that's deaths uh, in the first year but after the first month of life, as an indicator of the health environment. Okay. And what our estimates suggested was that um, higher post-neonatal mortality rates were associated with a higher probability that the mother, who, who we see at the time that she gives birth to her own child, had diabetes at that time. Okay. And uh, for blacks, we see a much bigger effect than for whites, which is consistent with the much higher mortality rates for black infants. I'm going to turn to talking about the effects of pollution. This is something I've been working on a lot in recent years. This picture is actually from the Environmental Protection Agency's website. They have a program that's called the Toxic Release Inventory. And what it says is, it's, it's also called the Community Right to Know Act, colloquially. And the idea is that if you're a community, you have a right to know what the factory in your backyard is um, emitting. Okay, so any factory that uses more than a certain number or, or a certain amount of listed chemicals is required to report how much they're discharging. It's a very interesting law from the point of view of an economist because it doesn't say you can't discharge that. It doesn't say you have to clean it up. It just says you have to report it. So what they're assuming is that if you make the information known, then you know, something will happen and uh, things will improve. In the U.S., the uh, main pollutants that are tracked, what are called the criterion air pollutants that are tracked under the Clean Air Act, have fallen over the time period that I'm talking about. So this is showing data for <coughs> ozone, lead, carbon, carbon monoxide, uh, particulates, nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxide. So they, they've all been falling. Um, the fall for carbon monoxide is particularly steep. Um, in cities, carbon monoxide mostly comes from car exhaust, and so this mostly reflects cleaner cars. It doesn't reflect less driving. If anything, there's more driving over this period. So these kinds of pollutants have been linked to infant health. Um, in some work in New Jersey, we again, starting with the birth records and linking siblings, focused on people, mothers, who lived near air quality monitors. So um, 
the idea is that we're going to take people who live near an air quality monitor. We can see what's happening to the air. Um, and then we can see, for the same mother, a baby that was born at a time when there was a lot of pollution and a baby who was born at a time when there was less pollution. And then we can compare those babies and say, on average, are the ones who are born when there's less pollution healthier? And if we do that, we see that more pollution is associated with more low birth weight. So that's what the first bar here is showing. Um, and so here, a, a one unit change, which is actually almost a, well, it's a more than a 50% change, is associated with about an 8% increase in the probability of low birth weight. Okay. But here, um, the other bars here are trying to show that the, the same shock being exposed to pollution has a bigger effect on some people than on other people. Uh, so pr in particular, if the mother smoked and she's exposed to pollution, it has a much bigger impact on the probability of low birth weight. Similarly, if you look at moms who are over 35, who are more likely to have low birth weight babies, pollution has a bigger impact on them. If you look at moms who have other risk factors for the pregnancy, like they have hypertension, or they have diabetes, or they have a previous preterm infant, um, the pollution shock also has a bigger effect on them. Okay, so, so what this is showing is that um, there can be sort of compounding of disadvantage in the sense that the same people who are the most vulnerable to begin with suffer the most from the same type of shock. Okay. Now, unfortunately, it's not like everybody has equal probability of being exposed either. Um, poor mothers are more likely to be exposed to almost all kinds of pollution. They're more likely to live near busy roads. They're more likely to live near um, what are called Superfund sites in the U.S., which is a, a hazardous waste uh, disposal site. They're more likely to live near factories that are emitting some kind of toxic. Okay. So, um, Again, just to give you some sense of how, how big these differences are, um, this figure is looking at birth data for five large states and just plotting the number of people in different groups who live within 2,000 meters of a site that's releasing some sort of toxic that's tracked in the toxic release inventory. Okay, so you can see for white moms, it's about 40% of moms that are living close to a toxic release inventory site. For black moms, it's 60%. And for black high school dropout moms, it's closer to 65%. So this is a little shocking. This is, it's very common to be living near something that's emitting toxics. But you can see that there's a very large disparity. A question is, how much, of this, how much does this disparity account for in terms of the kinds of gaps that I was showing you at the beginning of the talk. Um, and so there's a lot of technicalities involved in trying to measure that. I mean, one problem is how close do you have to be to one of these things before it's actually harmful? Um, you would think you could just look that up, but you can't. Uh, so one part of, of my research has been trying to answer that question by looking at all the hazardous uh, pollutant monitors that are out there, seeing that they're different distances from a plant, and then just asking, well, if the monitor is a thousand meters from a plant, can I detect anything? If it happens to be two thousand meters from a plant, can I detect anything? Okay, and so on. So if you do that, um, and you can do that for all these different tracked chemicals. So this is just showing some relatively common ones like benzene. Um, if you do that, it turns out that if the monitor is more than a mile away from the plant, usually you can't detect anything. Okay. Um, similarly, for cumin, it's about a mile away. Uh, for some other things, like for methyl chloride, which I guess must be a bigger molecule, if you're a half a mile away from the plant, you can't detect it. Okay, so, so we, after looking at a whole lot of these things, decided, okay, we're gonna use about one mile as a rule of thumb. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare the people who live within one mile of one of these plants to the people who live one to two miles from the plant. And we're gonna compare them 
when the plant is open and emitting things, and when the plant is shut and not emitting anything. Okay. And the reason for picking um, the people one to two miles away is, you know, arguably they're not being exposed to the pollutants, but if there's an economic benefit of the plant, for example, they're still getting the economic benefit of the plant. They could still work there or, you know, have a business that relied on uh, business from the plant. Okay. So using this sort of a, a research design, this plot is kind of summarizing what we found uh, in terms of what is the impact on birth weight. Okay, so what we see here, uh, this first bar, okay, if this is going the wrong direction. This is saying being exposed uh, is reducing your probability of being in the zero to 1,000 gram range. Okay. Now this other line here, this is the standard error bar, and what that's saying is that this is a really imprecise estimate, and the reason for that, again, is that there's just not very many babies in that category. Okay. So I'm going to argue you should disregard that one. Um, if we look at the next two bars here, this is the probability of being in the 1,000 to 1,500 gram category, and this is the probability of being 1,500 grams to 2,000 grams. <coughs> Both of these are statistically significantly positive and uh, different than zero. Okay? So what this is saying is that being within one mile of an operating plant that's emitting toxic releases is associated with a higher probability of births in those two very low birth weight categories. Okay. Um, and then you can kind of do a back of the envelope calculation and say, okay, um, we know where the mothers are relative to the plants. We know that the black moms are more likely to be close to these plants. Now we have an estimate of how much that matters. And so putting it all together, what we estimate is that about 6% of that gap in the incidence of low birth weight between the white college educated mothers and the black high school dropout mothers could be just because of this differential exposure to toxic chemicals. Okay, so you were probably all thinking that I was going to say like 75% or 90%, it's only 6%. But still, if you think about all the different um, uh, things that people are potentially dealing with, I think this is a, a significant sized effect. The last thing I wanted to talk about a little bit was health behaviors. There's a lot of health behaviors that we can observe that are listed on the U.S. birth certificates. Um, you see big disparities in a lot of these things. I'm going to focus on smoking because you can see this is really a stunning disparity here. Disadvantaged moms, um, about 20% of them are smoking <coughs> during the pregnancy. White college educated moms know that they're not supposed to do that. Okay. Now this gap has actually been falling over time. So in 1990 it was much bigger. Um, and it's, it's fallen quite a bit. And if you uh, sort of superimpose that gap in smoking on the gap in low birth weight, it tracks really, really nicely. Okay? And you can do this for each state, and it, it tracks. Now, maternal behaviors are themselves affected by anti-smoking policies. In the U.S., we had the tobacco settlement and then states were supposed to use the money to pursue, um, that was when they sued the cigarette companies and they got a whole lot of money and then they were supposed to use it to uh, implement anti smoking <coughs> policies. Um, and so some of the policies that were implemented were things like cigarette taxes, bans on smoking in the workplace, um, and those have had a significant effect on these smoking gaps. Uh, and so an interesting thing about this is that something that on the face of it might seem um, neutral or even regressive in that um, cigarette taxes are going to be a larger share of poor people's income than rich people's income are having a disproportionate benefit on the babies born to poor mothers by causing them to smoke less. You can also look at weight gain during pregnancy. This is the one thing that I'm going to show you that goes the wrong way. Um, this is just plotting weight gain during pregnancy against the probability of low birth weight. You can see it has this nice U shape. So this is saying that the optimal weight gain during pregnancy is about 30 to 40 pounds. And if you look at what's going on, 
Um, what you see is increases both in people who are gaining too little weight, this is less than 15 pounds, and people who are gaining uh, really a lot of weight, all over 60 pounds. And these are for the three different education levels. So this is the high school dropouts, and these are the college-educated moms. But it's, it's sort of moving in the wrong direction for everybody, regardless of education level. OK, so going back to my checklist, basically all the things that I suggested except for changes in fertility may have something to do with this reduction in inequality in health outcomes for children, even though there was increasing economic inequality. I'm not going to have uh, time to talk about some of the other policies that might be important, things like feeding programs. Um, in the US, there's a feeding program called the Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, which has been shown in many studies to prevent low birth weight and have positive effects on children. There are income transfer programs. Um, child care programs have, have very positive effects, particularly for poor children. To wrap up, what I've showed you is health at birth is very strongly related to socioeconomic status. We know that inequalities in economic status have been increasing over the past 25 years, especially in the US, more than most other places. But the good news is that inequalities in the health of young children have actually been decreasing over time. And so what I think is that this is a really powerful argument for public policy. We don't have to sit back and say, well, because you know, there's globalization and increasing economic inequality, that means that the lot of poor people is just going to get worse. <coughs> there's things that we can do that have a real impact um, on the, the health of the poor, even if family incomes are deteriorating. So thank you very much.